I will now call to order the Monday, March 19th, 2012 informational meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council. Welcome to all of you here at Carnegie Town Hall, those watching us on CityLink or at SiouxFalls.org. We'll begin today with a staff report. No report. Thank you, Denise. We'll then go on to a, a report on the Monday, March 12th Public Service Committee. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. On uh, the Public Services Committee on uh, March 12th, the discussion was a review of the naming rights ordinance uh, with Community Development Director Darren Smith. Uh, Darren gave an update on naming rights ordinance and covered the following topics. Permanent or temporary rights, the application and fee process, the process for removing names, naming rights agreements, financial disclosures, committee reviews and grandfathering existing agreements. Uh, the discussion focused on uh, ordinances used by Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Director Smith stated he would like to present a draft ordinance at the Public Service Committee meeting May 14th and we'll be in contact with other public facilities that may be Im impacted by a new ordinance. And that was the end of the discussion. Any questions for Councillor Anderson? If not, thank you, Councillor. We'll now go on to City Council open discussion. Councillor Rolfing. I have two items um, of, in of hopefully some interest. Uh, first of all, next week uh, is a scheduled time for the land use uh, committee meeting following the um, open or the um, informational meeting. Uh, because of some um, pushbacks in, in schedules and things, we will not have that meeting next week. I did also want to inform uh, people, though, that on the 30th of this month, um, the uh, Urban Ag uh, Committee or Task Force is having uh, our second meeting of this month at the Ronning Branch, uh, uh, Ronning Branch Library out on 49th and Southeastern Drive, approximately, and we'll be beginning at 3.30. Should be adequate parking out there for everybody, and we're um, finishing up our our um, the end of the um, gu uh, gardening or the uh, um, community garden section, and we'll begin uh, start looking at the animal section of the uh, of the ordinance. So, uh, anyone who's interested uh, is welcome to attend. So, come join us. Thank you, Councillor. Any other council open discussion? Councillor Anderson. Um, I've asked uh, Mark Cotter to come and give the council just a brief overview of the water main breaks that have happened recently within the city. Uh, I've had a lot of reply from the community just asking questions about that, and I thought it would be a good informational. Thanks, Councillor. Director Cotter. Uh, thank you, Council Chair and Council Members. Mark Cotter with the Office of Public Works. Um, I did hand out a one-page memo that just tries to capture uh, information on water main breaks and just to provide some additional context uh, for you. And I think if you don't mind, I'll just go through the highlights. I also do have additional copies for the audience that are at the entrance table. Essentially, the city's water distribution system consists of a, just at about 1,000 miles of water mains, and they can range anywhere from 2 inch up to 42 inch in diameter. We maintain just under 20,000 valves, and they are key when we do have a break so we can actually isolate the area down as, as small as possible. And then the combination of public and private fire hydrants adds up to nearly 8,500 hydrants. Um, the system provides safe drinking water of adequate volume and um, pressure so we can provide fire protection to ne the nearly 48,000 billable accounts. Um, we do have a very extensive capital program that you've seen over time and that complements us as we analyze the, the revenue adequacy for the fund because it is an enterprise fund that stands on its own and as we've not only um, planned for the maintenance and replacement but also those, those large um, assets in the future so make sure we have a good long-term water supply like Lewis and Clark. All those have been considered when we have done our rate reviews. Um, now, as far as the water main breaks, again, we characterize them normally as we call it a water main break 
if you start to see water um, coming up to the surface, that's how we get identified. A customer or a traveling person will call in and, and notify us that at X location, um, water is coming up to the surface. But then to accurately identify if that's on a, a pipeline or a valve uh, or a private service line, we have to excavate down and truly observe what the conditions are. We typically put them into two different buckets. We either call them other breaks, which that means that they can be circular breaks or longitudinal breaks. We could have an issue with a valve because valves are, they're not one piece. There's a series of bolts that hold them together as well and attach themselves to the water mains. And then each individual account has their own service line. And so we see breaks on the public and the private side of the water system just with the vast um, size of our city. We have about 75 square miles of mature land and all of those uh, areas are served by our water system. So we characterize it as either other breaks um, or corrosion breaks. Corrosion can occur if there is um, the right conditions, um, wet, uh, water bearing soils that really create that uh, environment. And if, and if the pipes are not wrapped in what we call poly, polyplastic, of which we do in today's world if we do not put in PVC, they don't have that corrosion protection and that's where we see some of those corrosion breaks. The highest concentration in Sioux Falls that we see corrosion breaks are in the south and west part of the city. It's an area we call Western Heights and we've had a very aggressive program out there for the last um, six to seven years. Okay, there's a graph that also shows that kind of separates what we consider as corrosion breaks and other breaks. Um, in 2011, we had, a, we had a fairly high breakage rate um, and that contributed to, we had one segment in Western Heights in 1,000 feet of pipe where we had six breaks. And so we actually accelerated that project last year and reconstructed it. Um, we had a favorable fall and so all those services in that 1,000 feet of pipe was all reconstructed so those customers did not have to see uh, any further water, water interruptions. Um, we do evaluate the system based on a number of criteria I'm right below the graph now. We do look at type of pipe, pipe age, pipe size, pipe length, and break history. As we look at what our maintenance program is going to be and the roads that we're going to reconstruct for the year, um, not only is the surfacing engineers in the room, but also are the principals for water, sanitary sewer, um, storm sewer, and lights. And they can weigh in on where they've had issues so we can direct those capital dollars in those areas. Um, and then we prioritize that work accordingly. We have, uh, there's an industry article that's been sourced just to give you a perspective, not just on our data, but uh, but what the American Water Works Association sees. And um, they, as they had stated, water utilities experience between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 breaks per mile per year. Our data recorded, and we captured back to 1998 for the comparison, uh, indicates that the water distribution system for the city of Sioux Falls is at 0 0.054, so half of what the lower band of that uh, indicator is. Um, and so based on, you know, using that study as one element um, of analysis, it, it certainly shows that we're below the industry trend for certain on what our breaks are, and it does give you an indication of what the health of the system is. So very healthy. So outside of that, I can certainly uh, answer your questions, but this is, uh, not unusual from a standpoint that we are in a very northern climate where we see um, the, the upper tiers of our soil in the wintertime uh, freeze and so that makes everything rigid and then when it, based on the rate of the thaw, um, it can certainly provide shifts in the ground which then can create those circular or those longitudinal cracks. So, um, Right now, year to date, we have 17 um, and again, we're, we'll manage it as they come in. Questions for Director Cotter. <coughs> Councilor Anderson. Mark, of some of these new breaks, how would you categorize those breaks? Um, there was differences at 20th and Jefferson, that was a pipe split. Um, in the downtown area, we had two valves. Um, there was a time period for about 15 years or so 
um, in the mid eight, in the early 80s to the mid 90s, where valves were installed, and um, they were not used stainless steel bolts. And so one of the things that we're seeing is that, and that was in a fairly high uh, growth time there in those early 90s. A lot of a lot of water infrastructure went in place, and and those medium strength steel bolts that are in those valves, they essentially hold the top part of the valve on. Um, are not standing up to corrosion like they are today with stainless steel. And so every valve that goes in and every valve that I believe has gone in since the mid-90s has had stainless steel bolts, and they're just, um, uh, they're protected from corrosion. <clears throat> uh, in our replacement program, how uh, many pipes do we have that are still unprotected uh, with PVC or the polyplastics as you were describing them? Um, well, there's a number in the mature part of town, but again, uh, if they're not in a corrosive environment, if they're in a, um, if they're in a dry environment, um, just based on the age of pipe, we don't go out and uh, replace it. And so we prioritize, I don't have a number to tell you in miles today, but we prioritize it based on um, the, the number of breaks that we see, um, number of service interruptions, Quite honestly, some of those mains that have been out there for decades still perform very well. Um, there was a time period uh, in the 80s as well where the city went in and essentially um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of material on the inside of the pipe, they call it tuberculation, and we went in and we ground all that out and then relined it with cement lining. And so not only from a water quality standpoint, but a capacity as well. So even those older mains have seen work um, over the last 25 years that that if they're in a good environment, they could extend their life uh, even further. So there's a number of different treatments that can be used and have also been used in the past. It's one of the reasons why Sioux Falls has some of the best water in the country. Is well, One more question. Uh, do we have any type of testing program for these older pipes just to try to be proactive about uh, replacement? Um, you know, the one of the key things that we'll see because one of the, on the, as you look at the graph, corrosion is the lower number. The other breaks, which are either circular or longitudinal breaks, um, they can occur just based on the shift of the ground. And the ground's always moving um, to a certain degree. And so some of those, I think, would be, um, you know, the best thing we can do is just monitor the system um, on an annual basis and really direct those resources to where they go. Um, but to say, Counselor, do we excavate down and either take a core out of the pipe and send it in for, um, we don't do strategies like that. Okay. Okay. Counselor Jamison. Mark, uh, you say our system is very healthy. <coughs> uh, what would be an indication of, uh, of a problem that you would say is a red flag? What, at what point be does it become a red flag? Um, I would certainly see, you know, just one indicator. If we were trending... Um, above where this industry average is because they, they take a number of different surveys from communities and to establish really what are the averages. We're clearly on the lower tier of even the lowest range of that average. But that would be one. And then I think just delivery of service. How many customers are we uh, interrupting service? And that's the other key reason is with the number of valves, when we do have a water service interruption, our goal is always to isolate it down to one block. Sometimes it gets beyond that to two blocks. Um, and then to, you know, certainly mobilize and try to get that water back on within three to five hours. Um, and so my, mm, that's just one indicator um, that I would see. But certainly investments have been made in the well field, the plant. Um, this year alone, we're making <coughs> nearly $4 million of an investment just in the distribution system. And that's not new extended mains, that is replacement mains. And so um, I think the city of Sioux Falls, as we've analyzed our operations and capital, um, getting our capital plan to that level is very responsible. I, I get the uh, reactionary part of it. Once it breaks, you know, you got to go yeah. fix it. And that's one way of monitoring it. Um, you know, when I see your graph here, it shows the corrosion breaks on, a, on, a, on an incline there that, that looks like it's just going nothing but up. And based on your knowledge of all these different lines and different systems throughout the city, surely you have a map that states, 
here's an area we're likely to have breaks mm -hmm. and uh, we should be planning for this and you're doing that and you're in a pro proactive manner uh, mm -hmm. uh, trying to remove some of these older lines before they fall apart. Right. Is that yeah, our concentration right now is to finish Western Heights. Western Heights was And then we'll go to the air base next. And many, much of that is very old mains. They're in a very shallow environment, sometimes a very water-boring environment. Um, and then, then we've got some pockets. We've got, we've got some pockets of areas in the city, but nothing to the concentration of, of those two areas. So those are where we've directed our resources. And for a period of time, we were sharing resources, doing a project in the air base and doing a project in Western Heights. Um, and just based on the density and the number of accounts that we have in Western Heights, let's say we said, let's, let's concentrate all of our efforts in that area. Um, and then we'll move into the air base. And so um, that's where we're going. Those are really our two areas in the city. And then we've got some spot areas that we just know in the spring of the year, um, in our climate, things move, things shift. You've got a relatively rigid system that's all interconnected. And with any movement in the ground, either vertically or, or sideways, you're going to have an interruption. So, Councillor Erpenbach. So what you're saying, Mark, is if the water mains were rubber, they could move with the earth, then we'd be in better shape? Yes, that would be, uh, be an added benefit. Every time I, it, you and I talked about this a little bit on, on Thursday in terms of that idea of the ground freezing and it moving mm -hmm. and, and all of that. And it seems like uh, the Central District has been hit a little bit harder on the, the water main breaks of, of late the last few days. And so I just wanted to say it, it's been amazing to me to know that one of those breaks was within two blocks of my mother's house. She had no idea it was broken and never was without water. Mm. And, you know, some of the other ones, the, the turnaround time for your folks has been within minutes of getting the call. You know, it's one of those things that, yeah, water's pretty critical to us, and especially in the morning when we're all getting ready for work. And so I just wanted to say how much we appreciate that, that we're able to make that stuff move as fast as we can so that folks aren't inconvenienced as, as, as little as possible anyway. So, but thanks. Very good. Most of the credit goes to uh, the two gentlemen that are right next to me and the teams that are under those gentlemen, Trent Lubers and, and Greg Anderson. Um, we have people on call 24-7 so we can minimize disruptions. Any other questions? Councillor Anderson. Just let one statement. Mark, I want to thank you for on short notice coming here to give us a good explanation of what's going on with our water. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you Director Cotter. Any other council open discussion? If not, we'll go on to presentations and we'll begin this afternoon's presentation with the 2012 Sculpture Walk program presentation. And it looks like we'll start but with Russ Sorensen. Welcome, Russ. Good afternoon, council members, viewing citizens. My name is Russ Sorensen with the City Planning Office and with me this afternoon is Mr. Jim Clark, South Dakota Principal Manager for XL Energy and the Sculpture Walk Director. Mr. Clark and I are here this afternoon to provide you with a glimpse of the proposed 2012 Sculpture Walk program. You'll be considering adoption of a resolution for the 2012 program in two weeks at your Monday, April 2nd regular meeting. The Sculpture Walk program is now in its ninth year. We've grown from, from 34 sculptures in 2004 to 56 sculptures here in 2012. For the program, several entries were received and again juried by Sculpture Walk Committee this year. It is, again, an international program and countrywide. We have uh, two countries, Nigeria and Canada, are represented along with 20 states in 2012 program. There are 56 sculptures and seven alternates with 48 artists this year in our program. There's over 100 businesses and individuals that contribute annually to the financial strength of Sculpture Walk, and we have over 50 volunteers to make Sculpture Walk a success. City staff representing the ADA Advisory Review Board, Public Works, Engineering, Planning, and Risk Management, along with the Visual Arts Commission, have all reviewed and favorably recommended this year's 2012 program. This is an important and significant program as it helps create a first impression of our downtown area to visitors and by bringing a large number of sculptures to the Central Business District for outdoor display. It simply enhances the beauty and the culture of our downtown area for all citizens and visitors to enjoy. With that, also on the 14th of April, you'll see sculptures coming down, and May 5th will be the new placements. 
based on your resolution of action. With that, then, I would like to introduce Mr. Jim Clark, who will give you, who will unveil the 2012 program this year. Jim? Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Council Chair. Counselors, thank you for the introduction, Russ. Uh, it's hard to believe we're going into our ninth year already. It just seems like yesterday I was here for our first year. We had 139 entries from uh, every area of the United States and two other countries. Our selection committee um, narrowed them down to 55 of the top sculptures and the alternates that you're going to see today. And uh, the sculpture photos and sketches that you're going to see came from the artist, so that's what the selection committee had to look at. Because of the uh, wonderful business growth in the uptown area, we're going to add five more sculptures to the program. So we'll have, we've, we're going from 50 this year to 55 next year. And those five will be north of 8th Street uh, on Main and uh, Phillips Avenue. For 2012, we had, have 48 artists from 20 states uh, and two other countries participating, and 16 of the 48 artists are new. So it's always good to have new artists participating. Uh, this, again, the sculptures and the sites that you're going to see go together. But between now and the 5th of May, there's a good chance that some of the sculptures will change locations. So I wanted you to be aware of that. That happens every year because an artist will drop out and we have to go with the alternates or a sculpture might not fit the pedestal that we have designed for it. We work on it year round and uh, like Russ said, we have 50 volunteers that work on it and uh, we continue to grow every year. We have 25 sculptures over to Vera. We have 12 at University of Sioux Falls. We have something like 15 that are leased. We're adding three at the airport. <laughs> We have four at the Orpheum. We have one out in front here, one at City Hall, and several at the zoo. So on and on and on and on. Every year we grow, which is wonderful. So let's go ahead and uh, show you the sculptures. It's going to be our best year ever. Okay, we start uh, in the South uh, Plaza at the Pavilion with Conversation of the Long Married. This is by Stephen Make. He's from uh, Florida. 11 foot tall sculpture. We have a lot of nice big sculptures this year, a lot of nice abstracts. King Bird from uh, Felix Ehis is from Nigeria. And this one is in front of uh, Home Federal on the northwest corner of 11th and Main. And then the next one is Emma by the River. Oh. This is a new uh, location. Uh, it's the Boyce Greenfield Law Firm. They just opened up on the southeast uh, corner of 11th and Main. And new artist, uh, Betty Branch, is from uh, Virginia. Another new artist, Bobby Carlisle, self-made man, is on the northwest corner of 11th and Phillips. And then also a new artist, Jim Green, uh, is uh, from Rapid City. It's good to have another South Dakota artist participating. And this is in front of the books shop. Another nice sized sculpture. Green Sea Turtles, another new artist. Uh, this is uh, in front of the uh, Carpenter, uh, mid block. Eric Thorson is from the Flathead Lake area, Northwest Montana. Leaf Lady, Albert Bellevue, uh, he's back. He's was with Sculpture Walk in the first few years and a seven foot tall leaf lady in front of Mrs. Murphy's Irish Gifts. Dakota Moon, Chris Powell has been with us just about every year. He's from Colorado and this is in front of the Prairie Star Gallery. Generation Slaps, big sculpture. It's eight by eight. Uh, it's going uh, on the southwest corner of 10th and Phillips. Matt Miller's second year in Sculpture Walk. He's from Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Uh, lighter than some, Gregory Mendez, also his second year. He's from uh, Indiana. This will be on the northwest corner of 11th and Phillips. Nice, shiny sculpture. Again, nice size. A lot of nice size sculptures. And then we get to some smaller sculptures. We have two pedestals close together south of the diner. And uh, when, when we have 
two pedestals together, we like the sculptures to be similar in size. This one is by Rizard from Colorado. This is 21 inches high. And How Do You Feel Today by Shohini Ghosh, also from Colorado. And then in front of the diner uh, is Michelle by Joe Castle, new artist from Idaho. Mary Zimmerman's sculpture, uh, Hobbit House, I think she's been with us every year. She's from uh, southern Colorado. I think this will be popular with the kids. And this, we're setting this on a lower pedestal, so it'll be two feet high so the kids can see inside it. And I hope there are some hobbits in there. It'd be disappointing if there weren't. Territorial Wars, uh, we have this one uh, between the diner and the fountain in Fountain Square, Del Pettigrew. Implement Bird, dined by Jackie Frazy. He's a new artist, South Dakota artist from Millbank. And he has an implement shop, and he's also an artist on the side, and these are all implement parts, so it's kind of neat. It will be popular. By the way, backing up a little bit, I suppose parents will put their kids in that tractor seat, and we do have insurance. <laughs> Circus trick number three, neat sculpture. I really like this one. Uh, almost 14 feet high. And this is going to go on Phillips Avenue, where it curves a little bit between 9th and, and, the, and the fountain. So it'll be visible on the street. Pilgrim of Peace, uh, Felix Velez from Colorado. This is life size Gandhi. He's only life size, he's four feet or five feet, four inches high. But uh, very nice sculpture. Felix does nice work. And he's from Colorado. And Fat Tire, done by Lance Carlton. Uh, we have a lot of sculptures in this block because there's a lot of room. Uh, he's from Washington State. And this will go where the bench is this year. And on the corner, Lee Looning and Sherry Treby, uh, they've been with us every year also, South Dakota artists. And this year they had the People's Choice, the two football players, uh, take off on Norman Rockwell. Well, they're on that same theme with schools out on the uh, southwest corner of Ninth and Phillips. And then we have Clarice on the northwest corner of 9th in Maine, which would be in front of Dakota, First Dakota National Bank. And then back on Phillips Avenue in front of Wells Fargo, this will be on a four foot tall uh, pedestal catching the wind. Greg Johnson's from uh, Georgia. Mother and child, Louisa Altman from New Jersey, new artist. This will be in front of uh, US Bank. Going north on Main, uh, on the northeast corner of 6th and Main in front of Fresh Produce will be uh, uh, Falcon's uh, Song of the Flying Dutchman. And Kyle's been in the program for the last five years, I think. This one actually has come out. Uh, the artist sold this one, I think, out in Washington. So we already went to an alternate. Actually, we have about three or four alternates all already in. Uh, Maelstrom, done by Craig Schneider. This will be in front of AdWorks. Pushing through will be back over on Phillips Avenue, mid-block, east side between 5th and 6th Streets. This is a 17-foot tall sculpture. Some of these are going to be a real challenge to move. But a challenge to get to Sioux Falls, because the artists put them on trailers, and then to get them off, we have a big forklift to do the work. And then mid-block east side between 7th and 8th will be Natalia. And this one also sold, sold so we're going to have to go to an alternate. Uh, this one is, uh, it's on the northwest corner of 8th and Phillips. Uh, right below one green leaf lady that we have on the light pole. This is the sculpture below it. Hands of Nature, uh, Chris Kilbane from up uh, in the Duluth area. Big sculpture, 10 feet high, very heavy. Uh, at the entrance to Shrop, and I'm not sure if that's going to work because that's all under construction. So another example of a this site we might not be able to use this year. <clears throat> Ancient Warrior, this is uh, done by Dee Clements of Colorado. 
this will be by R&L Supply in East 8th. Then across the street, this is our biggest sculpture, 18 feet high. In Vitz Bowen's Segway 3 by Bill Henry Walker, and uh, this is a picture of it in downtown Chicago, right on the river uh, patio area. And the next one, we're back on uh, Phillips now, in front of First National Bank at 9th and Phillips. Girls Can Do Anything by Julie Jones of Colorado. And Looking for Lunch, uh, done by Judd Nelson from uh, YZ of Minnesota. Uh, this is uh, on a four foot tall pedestal in front of First Financial Center. And moving south in the large planner, this is also in front of First Financial. And we'll move the, the concrete pad that's in that planter closer to the sidewalk for this piece. And uh, we needed to elevate it and get it on a real long uh, concrete pad. So this works well. Uh, Daughters of Peace, Ben Victor, South Dakota artist. Nice, nice, he's a nice, he does nice work. Huckleberry Days, a big uh, bear, done by Jerry McKellar. Uh, this sculpture is going where his Greek burrow is this year, and uh, that's the only concrete pad that would fit this nice big sculpture. He's from Washington. Rock and Roll, Pokey Park. We have three together here: Pokey Parks, uh, Stennis Standing. Uh, she, she, Marianne Will she is from New York City, very accomplished artist uh, from New York City. She's going to uh, conduct a panel discussion. We hope to hold that down at the Orpheum the afternoon after we set up the sculptures. We set up the sculptures in the morning. And this uh, will be one of the three. And then also the third one is Kate Christopher's Guardedly Optimistic. Um, she's from uh, the Minneapolis area. In front of Skelly's is Martha Pettigrew's uh, rabbit. Uh, across the street in front of Claudie's is Ben Hammond's Mother's Undivided Love. Ben, is, ben has won national awards for his work. And this is a nice uh, sculpture, a nice size, 54 inches high. Snappy, done by Judd Nelson. Uh, this is uh, going to be in front of Rayfeld's Gallery. Dreams of Ecstasy, it's all about the agony and the ecstasy that Mark and Eichinger from uh, Washington State. He's been in Sculpture Walk two or three years now. Also a nationally known artist. Uh, Cabinet Tree, this is in front of Chef Dominique's uh, Lee Badger from West Virginia. For long distance, Nathan Pierce, big sculpture, eight feet high, be at a four-foot tall pedestal in front of Shriver's. Nathan's also from Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And this also rotates. So we're going to have it high enough so it's, uh, no one's going to be able to, to grab it. It's not going to hit anybody if, if it happens to spin. <clears throat> Plenty of room. Indomitable Spirit, so this is in front of uh, Dakota Bank on the corner where the soccer players are now. And it's actually three figures coming out of a rock. And that's seven feet high by six feet wide. Need a big pedestal for that. To see and to say, uh, done by Serge Majnevsky, a Russian artist that lives in Vancouver. And uh, he's been in sculpture right now two or three years. This is aluminum. Uh, Manly Springs, done by Dana Parlier of New York City. Another large one, seven feet high. Hang gliding two, I uh, can't see this too well, but it's an eagle on a rock. Uh, Ken Bjorgi graduated from Washington High School in Sioux Falls, lives out in the Flathead Lake area in uh, Montana. And a very accomplished artist. In fact, last time I talked to him, he was delivering. He did uh, three sculptures for Auburn University, uh, Heisman Trophy uh, winners and uh, coach, I think. So. <laughs> Great artist. Grand finale done by Jennifer Cannon, new artist from uh, California. This will be in front of the federal building. Thought it fit there quite well. And it'll be way up high because it's on a fed 
uh, 14 feet high, it'll be on a four foot tall pedestal. Birds of Happiness, done by D. Clements, will be uh, on the northwest corner of 13th and Phillips. And then coming back on the west side of Phillips, down by Sushimasa, will be Daddy Longlegs. He'll, he'll actually be on the ground, not on, we were thinking about putting him on the side of a building, like the picture on the left. Maybe next year. Some logistics to get figured out there, I think. That's a nice big sculpture. Sentinel, Carl McMahon, a new artist from Canada. He lives uh, in the islands uh, out in the Pacific in western Canada, about as far west in, in Canada as you can get. I think. Real different work, and uh, real happy to have Carl participating in Sculpture Walk. Uh, and that's, this is in the northwest corner of Felton Phillips in the planner. And then uh, this one also pulled out. Pulled out since I've submitted these to the city. Uh, I think this one's going to Bellevue to replace the one that was sold in Bellevue, Washington. So look closer. This is in front of uh, Meyer Henry's law firm, Nick Lairos out of Minneapolis. Really different work. Can't wait to see what this one is, really. And uh, we do have insurance. <laughs> Focus, done by Osamito Bazi uh, from California. And this is the clay that you're looking at. He always does fantastic work. Did the golfer this year. Uh, just to show you what's out the airport, we thought this one fit. I, you know, I don't know how they're going to be able to let this one go next year because it's just on lease this year. It, it has to stay at the airport. It's such a neat piece. And it's nice size, too. Uh, Sunrise, done by Bill Noland of... Uh, Colorado. This was in Sculpture Walk 2005, and so I called him and I says, "Because uh, we want, they wanted something South Dakota. So, and this was the best uh, pheasant sculpture that I've seen. So I called him and he said, "Yeah, they'd like to bring it back." And then Coup Ponies is uh, Jerry McKellar's sculpture that's now over to Vera. So we have three beautiful sculptures for the airport. Alternates, uh, New Hope from Don Anderson. Uh, that's a big sculpture. I think that was eight feet high from her, right? Uh, taking flight from Ben Victor. Uh, Venezio from Stephen Mack. Sleeping Grizzly. This one is in Sculpture Walk now uh, by Eric Florson. You know, it's 58 inches long. Percolate by Chris Cobain. Solar Harmony by Chris, and this one may be in to replace that dog, the Great Dane that's sold. Uh, Between the Moonlight by Stephen Mack. And this is just kind of my notes on what we need to do as far as moving our pedestals. We do that the weekend. The 14th, we take them down, uh, the sculptures. The 21st, the next weekend, we do all of these moves. The city helps. Uh, we have Fegan help us out also, and they do a great job. And uh, and uh, that sculpture walk, 2012. Any questions for Jim? Thank you very much. Thank it looks you. like it's going to be great again this year. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the downtown Greenway project quarterly update. And I see Director Kearney coming forward. Good afternoon, City Council members. Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to give you another quarterly update on the Downtown River Greenway project. Uh, with us today are the usual suspects. Uh, Brad Lins is our project manager. Uh, Tori Miedema is an engineer in our office that ha handles our capital programs. And then also John Jacobson with Confluence. Confluence is our lead architectural firm uh, on the project. John's going to give you an update on where we're at on wrapping up phase one of the Downtown River Greenway, and then also uh, give you some highlights on what we're planning to do for phase two. So with that, I turn it over to John. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for having us again. We'll just get right into it here. Um, 
As you remember, the current phase one of the Greenway is under construction right now, but over the last six years, we spent a lot of time designing and planning the Greenway as it currently sits, and it's permitted with the federal government from Falls Park all the way down to uh, Faywick Park. Um, in the diagram above, you'll see the phase one area in, in red, um, and then the phase two area in orange. Of course, the phase two area, as you know, is a smaller project, but is going along in tandem with the redevelopment of the new proposed hotel site and the removal of the downtown river ramp. Um, as far as phase one goes, um, all the concrete wall construction is now complete um, over the course of the winter. Um, over 85% of all the stone masonry work is complete. Um, the amphitheater seat walls are currently being installed. Um, there's only two left of those here after last week and a little bit of wall cap. Um, the pedestrian light poles and ornamental lighting is all currently being installed and the primary power connections being made. And then the rest of the miscellaneous items such as the ornamental metal handrails, um, signage, and landscaping will all be complete by June 1st. Phase two um, is currently, all the conceptual design is currently done. We've submitted all of our permitting documents to the agencies listed there, including the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Corps of Engineers, the South Dakota Department of Natural Resources, the State Historical Society, and of course the State Game Fish and Parks. Um, as you know, the existing river ramp is scheduled to be removed here and then the latter part of, that month, in the, of this month and that work will start soon. Um, we're always coordinating and working with all the adjacent landowners surrounding the project. Obviously, we've been working closely with the developers of the hotel site. Um, the phase two project is scheduled to be bid in May of 2012 with an expected completion date of June 2013. Most of you are familiar with the site, but this is a good photo of our current site. This is what we're working with. Obviously, in the long-term plans of the Greenway, it was suggested to remove the river ramp. Its removal, obviously, will be a large aesthetic improvement for the downtown corridor, allowing views up and down the river. The phase two project is, uh, is a project of two primary issues. One, it's a project of accessibility for the public to get to the Greenway. This is a good example of the conditions which people have to enter the Greenway on the south side of the 8th Street. Um, it's a metal stair that probably predates all of us and obviously doesn't meet uh, modern building codes and accessibility rules. Um, this is a shot of the project site underneath the river ramp. Obviously, that's a good picture of the views that I'm talking about of opening up and, um, and seeing up and down the river. This is the end of our project. There's an existing old railroad bridge that crosses the river on the south side of the parking garage. Our phase two project will essentially go up to this existing railroad bridge. Um, and then the last part, bigger part of our project besides accessibility is obviously um, uh, improvements such as the pathway and stuff, but it's also environmental cleanup as well. The river ramp will, or I'm sorry, the bike path will be bypassed through improvements that are currently being made as part of the CNA redevelopment project along Reed Street. So, and the improvements that we're currently finishing is phase one. That's where the construction of these uh, bridges that connect the Greenway to all the secondary paths that go downtown are really important. We'll be using the new Greenway Bridge as part of our detour um, to be able to keep people on the Greenway but get them to Falls Park efficiently. Um, so whenever we do have an event on the Greenway, these new bridges allow kind of us to bypass certain sections. So that's the reason why they are so important. Um, this is an overview of the phase two project area and a, fa a future phase in front of CNA. This is the phase two project area. What you're seeing is the large tan footprint is the proposed hotel footprint and conference area along with its underground parking. Um, you'll see a ramp that comes off of 8th Street which will have new signage and steps as well. Um, if you look at the long length of that curve that goes all the way down to the Greenway that's kind of surrounded by those two dark bold lines, that's the distance it takes to make up the vertical distance to go from 8th Street down to the Greenway compared to that little set of steps that are currently in place. So you can see providing modern ramps that meet accessibility rules take up a lot of real estate 
um, and that's a good example. In combination with that ramp, we'll have a new overlook of the primary pathway as well as a secondary plaza. Um, this is a view from the 8th Street Bridge. You'll see a uh, new primary plaza down there with the river steps again and the interpretive light piers along with steps that go up to our secondary plaza. And we'll be using a lot of the same building materials that we used in the first phase that include concrete, um, quartzite, stone, and other architectural features. And then this is the, our last image of the proposed improvements as part of the secondary plaza that happens in front of the hotel that is as part of this transition space that goes kind of from public to private. And we're going to try to incorporate a water feature um, that kids and adults can interact with through the course of the spring and summer and fall. But when it's turned off, it just literally looks like a, a normal seating plaza where there's benches and seat walls and landscaping so that it doesn't look like an empty water feature. Um, it'll feature these little jets that shoot water back and forth, you know, kind of in intervals that you see in a lot of communities. Um, obviously, there'll be landscaping and other side amenities as well. So our phase two budget is approximately $2.75 million for the total project. Um, knowing the economy that we're looking at here and increased fuel prices and certain environmental conditions that we just don't know until we literally uncover it in the process of construction, we're building in a number of alternates to allow our base, bed flex base bid flexibility. Um, also, a lot of allowance to deal with the removals of contaminated soils and so forth. But we really feel like these alternates give us flexibility to make up for if fuel prices may go up to $5 a gallon at the time that we happen to bid this project. Um, there's a lot of things that we do in temporary construction of these types of projects that um, can also increase the cost, so we try to build in that flexibility. So things such as that water feature and those river steps um, will bid as alternates to either add or take away from the project as uh, the budget allows. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for John, Councillor Jamison. Hi, uh, John. Thanks for coming. Uh, how do you get, how do you manage this process when that hotel, you know, uh, the Shrapa place uh, was done and then the River Greenway came, and now it sounds as though you'll be ahead of that hotel project. How does that interfere with them? C and A will be done, and that works fine. But how, how do you manage that process with a building under construction? Well, we're, we've been working with them since really their proposal, the developer's proposal, was selected by the city. Um, our project will hopefully start and be completed by the time that they're done. But when it comes to things like access to our site off of 8th Street, um, we're developing joint shared access, which actually works a little bit easier for us. Because as you can imagine, access into this site is tight. We can't really come at it from the south because we'd have to come all the way up C&A and stuff. Um, I think the, to answer your question, Councillor, too, the primary problem is kind of the construction of the intermediate parts, like the patios and some of our steps that happen along the hotel. We'll have to develop a sequencing plan that works with the developer's construction dates as well um, that kind of allow our contractor access or allow them access as needed. And we stipulate that in the front end of the bid documents that kind of talks about the construction process. Um, but it very much is going to have to happen on almost a weekly basis. As part of this project, just like the last one, we'll have weekly construction project meetings where the adjacent developer and their construction team will be at those to coordinate those kind of issues. So it is problematic, but it's nothing that we haven't done before. Uh, you mentioned that perhaps you'd be done at about the same time? In, in, well, no, we, our project hopefully will be done before theirs. So. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, in June, normally a smaller project like ours probably wouldn't take a year, but we've added some extended time in there just because of those coordination issues. Okay, thanks. Councillor Rolfing. John, um, I'm looking at the, what you see up there, and I'm wondering how many people is that amphitheater going to see? 
Good question. Um, it, I don't remember, counselor, but my off the off shooting from the hip, my memory is it's about 150 people. Okay. So now it's assuming that it's just not sitting on the quartzite stone walls, but that's also sitting on the grass and still providing yeah. access. So. Yeah, I was thinking it wasn't going to be a... It's not a huge... No. no, no, it's not. And the idea about the Greenway was never develop huge spaces. It's to develop more... Intimate type yeah. things, yeah. Yep. John, I have a call-in question. How steep is the ramp in uh, Phase 2? The ramp meets the current building guidelines. A ramp is classified as a ramp if it exceeds a 5% slope um, or is under 8%. So it's actually at the lesser part of that. Um, so it's kind of at a medium slope, so to speak. It's in the 6% range. Um, but it'll also have landings per the building codes and handrails as well. Thank you. Other questions for John? Councilor Urbanbach. Question then about phase three. You know, phase two isn't, I mean, I know it's huge, but in the whole grand scheme of, we, if you look at that whole riverbank, phase two is a pretty small portion of it. What's, take us future a little bit. What's phase three gonna, where is well, that I at can in timing? Let Director Kearney address that, but from our planning standpoint, there's a number of smaller projects that we've been looking at for phase three. There's not a specific one that is part of the capital program right now. Okay. Uh, just to give you a little update, um, the Parks and Recreation Board has been working on identifying what additional phases uh, they'd like to pursue and uh, did recommend uh, uh, some additional funding for the River Greenway to the mayor. And, uh, and so we uh, do anticipate there will be some new proposals that the city council will see as part of the 2013 budget process to keep the momentum going on the River Greenway project and uh, pick up where we left off. And uh, so I think you'll see some of that as part of the budget uh, process. Okay, I appreciate that. I guess the, I don't want to seem like I'm trying to jump ahead and push ahead. This is a great project, but CNA is going to be done in a little bit, and their part of the Greenway isn't going to be done. So that's kind of what I'm thinking is we do need to keep that momentum moving. So thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Councilor, the other thing I would add to that is part of our current contract with the city, um, a more detailed design of that area south of Phase 2 along C8, CNA is part of our agreement as well. So we are developing and looking at that in more detail so that if funds were released for a project like that, we would be able to actively get going on it. Great. So. Thank you, John. Any other questions? Councilor Jamison. Uh, maybe a question for Don or John, whoever, but uh, the, the question is, I remember in the past when this project got started, there were some issues regarding contracts and agreements between property owners and the city based on what we would, we agreed we would do in exchange for some other considerations, but are there any other deals or considerations, contracts lingering out there that we should be aware of? Uh, no, uh, there, there aren't on any of these additional phases. Uh, obviously, I uh, would love to see the private redevelopment. Uh, I think the last time we announced that uh, uh, community development had identified that over the last uh, two or three years, uh, based on what's been built and what's proposed to be built is a little over $100 million. And so to see that private investment is great, uh, but there are no uh, other uh, contractual obligations that the city's under uh, to do more work there. It's based on what you decide to appropriate. Any other questions for Don or John? If not, thank you, gentlemen. If uh, there is no other business to come before this body, we are adjourned. <laughs>